Thank you everyone for joining us for today's Reproducibility Teach video. My name is Tracy Weisgerber and in this video we're going to talk about how to create transparent and reproducible western blot figures. The recommendations and figures that I will be showing you today as well as the data are from this paper called Blind Spots on Western Blots Assessment of Common Problems in Western Blot Figures and Methods Reporting with Recommendations to Improve Them. This research was done by an excellent team of early career researchers, including Christina Kroon, Larissa Brewer, Lydia Jones, and Zhihi An. And I would really encourage you to check out the paper for more information or to find more details of the figures that I will show you today. So before we begin, I'd just like to talk briefly about how Western blotting works. And many of you who are watching this video are already familiar with this, but it's important to set the stage for where the images that we use to create our figures come from. So as many of you already know, Western blotting is used to identify a protein of interest within a sample. And we start out by loading a sample containing the protein onto a gel. And the next step is to run that gel through electrophoresis. Applying electrical current causes proteins to move down the gel. And smaller proteins move at faster rates than larger proteins. So we end up with smaller proteins at the bottom of the gel and the larger proteins at the top of the gel. In step three, the proteins are then transferred to a membrane. And in step four, that membrane is probed with antibodies that help us to detect our protein of interest and make it so that we can view that um, protein with chemiluminescence or fluorescence or another mechanism. We then use a camera to capture an image or perhaps a film developer um, to capture an image of this fluorescent or chemiluminescent blot. And that image, as we see in six, will show us where the bands of interest appear on our blot in reference to a molecular weight marker of known scale. Okay, so let's begin by talking about how Western blot images are typically presented in scientific publications. In our paper, we looked at a sample of cell biology and neuroscience papers. And the first thing we found is that blots are almost always cropped. So instead of seeing the full length gel, like you saw in the previous image, we see a very narrow part of the gel that just focuses on the band of interest. We also found that there were a variety of strategies that authors are commonly using to label the molecular weights on their gel. Um, in about 35% of papers in our sample, the molecular weight labels were completely missing. The molecular weight of the protein was not labeled on the gel. In 30%, the labels appeared directly at the protein of interest, and in 25%, the labels appeared slightly above or slightly below the protein of interest. And this may suggest that they were based on a molecular weight marker, which was then cropped out, and so the labels are actually labeling the weight of the band of the molecular weight marker, which is what we'd ideally like to see. So I mentioned that almost all blots are cropped. What information are we missing when blots are cropped just to show the protein of interest? Well, this figure illustrates a full blot and then the various different presentation and labeling strategies that I mentioned on the previous slide. And in the full blot, you can see we have our protein of interest and we have a molecular weight marker which labels a variety of different proteins of known sizes, and then we have labels reflecting the sizes of those proteins. The thing that's visible on this full-length gel that isn't visible on the cropped gels, or the, the cropped images and blots, is these extra bands here. And there's one just above the protein of interest, and then another one slightly higher up. These extra bands are really important because they tell us that there is either nonspecific binding of the antibody or there is protein multiplicity. When we see a crop gel, that information about whether or not there are extra bands and where those bands are located is removed. And so we're missing information about whether there's nonspecific binding or protein multiplicity. So the next thing I mentioned is the molecular weight marker. Let's talk a little bit about that. Why do we need the molecular weight marker to be visible and labeled? 
So when we run a Western blot, part of the way that we determine that we have the right protein is by knowing that the protein is of the correct size, because Western blot separates proteins out based on their size. And so your molecular weight marker, which is shown in two on the main figure, is essentially the scale bar for your blot. It's the scale bar the same way that you would have a scale on a graph and you would want numbers along that scale so that readers could tell where different data points fell. For the same reason we need to have a molecular weight marker, we want to know that the protein we're looking for is roughly the size that we would expect it to be. So if the molecular weight marker is not shown, can we make inferences based on the position of the labels? And I talked a little bit about this earlier, that there are two labeling strategies. In one, the labels appear just a little bit above or below the protein of interest, whereas in the other case, they are at the protein of interest. Labels that appear just above or below may suggest that they were based on a molecular weight marker band, which was then cropped out. In contrast, when the label appears directly at the band of interest, it could be that it was not based on a molecular weight marker, but simply based on a calculated weight of the protein. It could also be that the protein was the same size as a molecular weight marker band, um, and so the authors were confident putting it at the at the band of interest and um, did not show the, the extra lane containing the molecular weight marker. However, these are inferences and we really can't be sure unless the molecular weight marker is visible. So we really want to do want to see the molecular weight marker bands on every gel or blot that we look at and we want to see the labels that correspond directly to those different molecular weight marker bands. Okay, so when we're labeling our molecular weight marker, um, we've talked about this, we want to see the bands from the molecular weight marker, and then we want to see a label corresponding to each band that we show. Again, just like you would have labels on the scale of your graph or other types of figures. How can you make your Western blots more transparent and informative? The first thing you want to do is crop as little as possible. And the rationale for this, again, is that readers can see whether additional bands are present, and those bands may be due to nonspecific binding or to protein multiplicity. So we want to show full blots or full length blots when it's possible. And if blots are cropped, then we want to show a minimum of one molecular weight marker band above and one below the protein of interest. In this case, the protein of interest is actually directly at a molecular weight marker band. And so here we want to see at least three different molecular weight marker bands, one above, one below, and one at the protein of interest. And again, showing more or a full length blot would be fine here as well, but this is the absolute minimum we would want to see. So the next point that we want is we want to include a molecular weight marker so that readers can clearly see that marker on the blot image. And we want to label each marker band. Um, so here again, we have one at, one marker band at the protein of interest, one above, one below, and all three are labeled with the size of the proteins at those bands. The next thing we can do is to deposit all of our blot images on a public repository where readers can access them. Why can we do this? Well, it's important to do this for three reasons. The first is that it allows readers to see full length versions of any blots that were cropped in the figures in your paper. The second is it allows readers to confirm that the blot shown in each main figure is representative of the replicates that were performed. And the third is it allows readers to confirm that raw data exist for each reported replicate. And the strategies for making it easy for readers to match what they see in a figure in your paper with what they see in the source data. The first thing is to use a good labeling strategy so readers can clearly match the blots that are shown in the figure to the blots that are appearing in the source data. So you want to annotate your saved images in the repository with figure and panel numbers as well as name of the protein to make it easy for readers to match figures to source data. 
The next thing you want to do is highlight the cropped region that's shown in the paper. So this is what's shown and we have drawn a box around it on the source data so that readers can clearly see what region was cropped out or what region was selected to show in the paper. And then lastly, we want to make sure that the full range of molecular weight marker bands and labels is visible um, in the image deposited on the repositories. Where can I deposit raw blot data? So we recommend that you use a public repository to share your source image files. The reason for this is that data search engines are unlikely to find source data that is stored in the supplemental files of the paper, and data stored in supplemental files of papers can also easily get lost if the publisher changes platforms or if there are technical errors. So we would encourage you to use free data repositories, and some examples might be Figshare or the Open Science Framework. One last thing I want to talk about is white background. So why should I be concerned if the background of the blot is white? The reason you should be concerned is that white background suggests non-uniform brightness adjustments. So here we see three different, exam different examples. In A, the blot background is a light gray. It is light, but it is also clearly distinguishable all the way around from the white background of the paper. In B, the blot has been lightened so that the white background is no longer just, or the, the background of the blot and the edges of the blot are no longer distinguishable from the edges of the paper. And in C, that adjustment has been done to such an extent that bands have actually been removed. So the faint bands that are visible in A and B are actually gone in C because the adjustment was so extreme. So it is acceptable to lighten or darken your blot, but it needs to be applied uniformly to all sections of the blot so that you are not um, enhancing contrast in one region compared to the other. As soon as you get to the point in lightening where a section of the blot background is white, that section can no longer be lightened. And so any adjustments that you apply after that to further lighten the blot will not be uniform. And if you keep adjusting past that point, you can actually erase faint bands or features of the blot, which is misleading and um, bad practice. So you want to always ensure that the blot background is gray and clearly distinguishable from the white page that the blot appears on. Sometimes when we're working with Western blots, we quantify the bands in order to present um, quantitative data. So how should we present quantitative blot data in a graph? We recommend using dot plots to present quantified Western blot data. And these dot plots are important because they allow readers to see the sample size as well as the spread of the data points or the distribution of the data. Why do we recommend a dot plot as opposed to a box plot or violin plot? Well, the reason for that is that sample sizes for Western blot experiments are typically very small. And we learned in the video on the inappropriate use of bar graphs and how to replace them with more informative graphs, that dot plots are the best choice for very small data sets because the summary statistics shown in box plots and violin plots are only meaningful when we have enough data to summarize. So use a dot plot if you are quantifying and graphing your Western blot data. So in summary, there are several things you can do to make your Western blot figures more transparent and reproducible. First, crop your blots as little as possible. Second, include a molecular weight marker on every blot and label the size of each molecular weight marker band that you show. Third, deposit raw blot images for all blots and replicates on a public repository and cite that data in your paper. Fourth, ensure that the blot background is gray and clearly distinguishable from the white page. And fifth, use dot plots to present your Western blot quantification data. What about methods reporting? Methods for Western blots are a really important part of making sure that others can reproduce or replicate your methods in their own laboratory. I won't have time to go into details on this on this video, which is part of visualization series, 
but you can see our paper for more details on what to report in the methods section. And table one in the paper also lists other resources and papers on good Western blot practices for methods reporting, as well as other aspects of Western blot studies. I would like to thank all of you for watching this video today, and we hope that you found it helpful. Thank you very much.